our final stop tonight is going back down to the borderlands or close to the border to the Sonoran Desert province of Arizona where the temperatures are high and water is scarce. Unfortunately, this year, I'm afraid those two criteria describe most of the state of Arizona, but um, this is an area that our next speaker, Phil Brown, knows well. Phil has lived in the Tucson area for 20 years, and he is now the, currently the coordinator of the docent program at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. That's a very rig rigorous program. I know that people aspiring to be docents have six to eight months of, of coursework and material that they have to master. And so that suggests that Phil has a broad and a deep understanding of Sonoran ecology. Phil's from California. His academic training is in both botany and zoology, graduated from Humboldt State. And the jobs that he's held over, over his career have been largely focused on interpreting natural history to public audiences. So he's been a zookeeper, he's been a summer camp naturalist, he worked for the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, and now he's working for the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum. And he is going to talk about the Sonoran Desert, land of tall cacti and small trees. I am going to talk about the Sonoran Desert, one of my favorite places, uh, largely because I live here. It is the land of tall cacti and small trees. These are both uh, uh, characteristics of this particular desert. And I've picked plants that are big and obvious. Uh, I don't have any rare plants in this uh, program. You don't have to scramble up over any rock uh, boulder canyon walls or hang on the edge of thousand foot cliffs to see these. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but every once in a while it's nice to have a, a drive-by botanizing session. And that's what this will be. So the Sonoran Desert, as we've mentioned in several programs now, is one of four deserts in the North American continent. And uh, actually, the fun fact here is that all four of them occur to some extent in Arizona, and that's the only state that has representatives of all four deserts. The Sonoran Desert um, is that one, and it is the lowest in elevation. Uh, one of the warmest of North American, it is the warmest of the North American deserts, and has been mentioned before, there's two rainfall seasons, the winter rains that come off of the Pacific and the summer monsoon storms. This year they were non-soon, but uh, they usually come off, uh, pull up moisture from the Gulf of California. And there's a great deal of biodiversity, not only to all those influences that have been mentioned in previous programs, the Rocky Mountains, Sierra Madre, and the Great Plains and especially tropical deciduous forest, but the uh, variations in topography, everything from below sea level to the tops of sky islands. The Sonoran Desert covers parts of two states in the United States and three in Mexico. And within that region, there have been more than 2000 described plant species. Now, the Sonoran Desert itself, as we know it, has been split up into six subdivisions, two of which occur in Arizona. Um, Val and Karen pretty much covered the lower Colorado Valley subdivision. I'm mostly talking about the Arizona Upland, which is the highest subdivision, uh, the coolest, and one of the wettest, not the wettest, but one of the wettest subdivisions. And the picture here on the right is a typical Arizona Upland scene. Now, the signature plant uh, of the Sonoran Desert, the only way you can miss it is to not look. It's, uh, it literally towers over everything else, and that's, of course, the saguaro, the Carnegia gigantea. It is the largest cactus in Arizona and the United States. It's not the largest in the Sonoran Desert, but it is the largest in the uh, United States, called a columnar cactus because it resembles an architectural column. They can grow occasionally, a few of them will make it over 50 feet tall, and a few of them can live over 200 years. So they're an impressive plant. And the, uh, the flower is Arizona's state flower. Now the cactus flowers, each one opens around 10 at night, is open through the night and into the late afternoon of the next day before it wilts away. And this is probably a strategy for reaching as many potential pollinators as possible. Uh, nectar eating bats at night, 
bees and butterflies and, and the birds during the day, particularly the uh, white-winged dove, which are up here in Arizona at the same time the, the saguaro is flowering. Now the Tohono Autumn, uh, the people who live here and have lived here for centuries consider the saguaro a relative. Uh, in their creation stories, saguaro was originally a human being. And so they think of saguaros as kind of uh, of kindred souls. And if you look at Savaras long enough, you can see this. They all look like people and you've seen cartoon books where the, cart or the cactus are talking to each other and that sort of thing. They get strange crest-like growths uh, that help look like weird hairdos. Their arms do odd things. Um, woodpeckers kind of enhance the look sometimes with some of their holes. And as you can see, they uh, occasionally travel in gangs. Uh, two other columnar cacti that occur in Arizona, the organ pipe cactus is one of them, and uh, it grows a slightly different form. Instead of one major stem with a lot of branches, it branches mostly from the ground or has new stems from the ground, and it grows maybe 15 to 20 feet tall. It has these spiny fruits that are absolutely de delicious, but as you can see, they're pretty well armed and you have to work for your uh, your meal, but uh, they're an important food source for a lot of the people in northern Mexico. And the other is the Sinita cactus, Lophosaurus shotai. And uh, this cactus comes into the United States just in the extreme southwestern part of Arizona in Organ Pipe Cactus National Monument, which was named for the previous cactus. Organ Pipe actually occurs uh, in several little areas along the border here. Uh, and there's a few, that are, there's a couple that I know of in, in uh, the Tucson Mountains here, uh, one in Saguaro National Park West. And I suspect the seed bank for those is uh, based here at the Sonoran Desert Museum. But uh, the Sunita pretty much is limited to Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument in the United States. Sunita is also called the old man cactus because of the gray beard. Um, it was not known until just a few decades ago that this cactus is pollinated by a specific species of moth, which is cleverly called the Sunita moth. And um, it's very similar to the story you heard earlier uh, yesterday about the uh, yucca moths. This is a, a real close symbi symbiotic relation between the moth and the cactus. And we have Sunita cactus planted here at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. And they flower. This is a picture of one of them in flower, but they never set fruit. And even though it's only about 150 miles to Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, the moth hasn't figured out that we have these plants over here. And uh, so far, they remain unpollinated. There's a lot of other big cactus. You can't miss them. Uh, some of them get very large, the Arizona barrel cactus. Sometimes it's called the fishhook barrel because the central spine in each aerial is curved and very sharp. I will attest to that personally. And they can grow sometimes to 12 feet tall. They are sometimes called the compass barrel because they tend to lean to the southwest. But that's a nice big cactus that you really can't miss. You'll see a lot of those. And they're flowering right now this time of year. They're the late bloomers of the cactus group. And the flowers may be red or yellow or orange, as you can see in the pictures here. And um, unlike the Western movies, uh, John Wayne was not able to tap into these. Thirsty Cowboys did not use these as canteens. They don't contain fresh water. There's a whole bunch of cactus um, in the group with paddle-shaped stems. Uh, collectively, we call them prickly pears. There's quite a few species around here, three in particular, well, two in particular that you'll notice. The uh, Engelmann prickly pear pretty much dominates the landscape as far as prickly pear cactus go. Now, it's my understanding this might actually be a complex of several species of cactus, but they all look very similar. They're cryptic species, and I don't know whether that's true or not. This is probably a, the time I should admit that primarily I'm not a botanist, but uh, uh, I, I fake one on TV. Uh, another 
prickly pear that's very common, commonly seen because it's used largely in landscape is the Santa Rita prickly pear. It is native south of Tucson and uh, in areas uh, that were explored yesterday, last night's programs. But it's been planted widely because of the purple coloration. It's a very popular landscape plant. Uh, a related group of uh, cacti are the choyas, the ones with the cylindrical stems. Many, many species. And to keep the botanists on their toes, these things tend to hybridize and really confuse people. But two that are really noticeable, the teddy bear choya, that fuzzy looking thing there on the middle top, uh, that's a teddy bear that you would hug once, not again. And uh, the chain fruit choya, so named because this year's fruit is growing out of the end of last year's fruit. The fruit never drops. Um, the seeds are basically sterile. There, it has pretty much done away with the need for seeds. It still grows fruit, um, but that it mainly propagates by sending pieces of itself hitchhiking with animals or people to get too close to it. Some people claim you don't have to get that close that it throws pieces at you or they jump. And so both of these actually are occasionally called jumping choya. Um, as an educator, I'm supposed to tell people they don't really jump. Yeah. Now the other part of the, of the uh, Sonoran Desert is it has a lot of small trees. Uh, most deserts have no trees at all or one or two species and they're um, generally restricted to certain areas like washes or that sort of thing. Uh, but in the Sonoran Desert, the trees will quite often dominate parts of the landscape. And a good many of these trees are legumes, the pea and bean family. And these are important, has been mentioned several times because of their nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in their roots, uh, in nodules in their roots. And this fixed nitrogen, of course, makes the soil more um, fertile for other plant life, as well as the plant that it's, it's uh, supporting. And the seed pods of all of these are edible and are important food sources for both animals and people in the desert. Uh, two very noticeable ones found in Arizona are the Palo Verdes, the blue Palo Verde, and the foothills or little leaf Palo Verde. Blue Palo Verde is generally restricted to washes and watercourses. The uh, uh, foothills Palo Verde covers more of the desert. You'll see it covering whole foothills. The Palo Verde is Arizona state tree. Now I just said there's two Palo Verdes. Arizona said the Palo Verde is the Arizona state tree. They didn't specify. So uh, as a result, we have two trees that are the state tree. Um, I came from California. We have two trees there that are state trees because the redwood is the state tree. Well, when I talk to people about state trees, people who come from areas where trees are great big tall things go, what tree? And you have to explain to them, well, this little greenish shrub with the uh, green bark that photosynthesizes even when it drops its leaves is our state tree and we're proud of it. If they come here in April or May, they would see that it's really a very showy uh, and spectacular tree. The, uh, the hillsides become golden with it. This is what the Tohono O'odham refer to as the yellow month. Everything is blooming. The, the uh, prickly pear cactus, the brittle bush, all of these palaverdes, and they all have yellow blossoms. Uh, other legumes, the acacias, both white thorn and cat claw, uh, the velvet mesquite, desert ironwood, baby bonnets, and the fairy duster. All grow seed pods all fertilize the soil and all in their time have pretty spectacular blooms and uh, are important parts of the ecosystem in the Sonoran Desert. Ocotillo uh, is found not only in the Sonoran Desert but also in uh, probably the southern Mojave at least and parts of the Chihuahuan Desert but uh, it's real noticeable plant, 18 or 20 feet tall with these spiny whip-like stems. Most of the time they're bare 
in April and May, and again, sometimes in the later summer, they'll have these red flower um, fluorescences, these tips at the tips of their, of their stems. And this gives them the name Ocotillo, which basically means little torch. And they're an interesting plant. They, they deal with drought by dropping their leaves and staying barren. They do have green stems. They do have some photosynthesis that occurs in the stems, but within 36 to 72 hours after substantial rainfall, they just get carpeted in these one inch green leaves. Then they'll photosynthesize like crazy while the, uh, the water supply is good. And again, as, as it dries out, the, they'll drop these leaves and store the sugars and starches in the stems. Now they, may do this four or five or six times a year on a good wet summer, which we certainly did not have this year. They will stay green throughout the summer and then they provide us with, of course, our very famous Sonoran Desert fall colors. And uh, there you go. There's a couple of yuccas. There's a number of yuccas, but uh, two of which are noticeable, the Arizona yucca, which my understanding is it's a uh, formerly considered a variety of the banana yucca and now has been separated. I think uh, Wendy touched on this and, and uh, I think a couple of other people mentioned it yesterday. The Arizona yucca, find, uh, we find some of those even up in the higher parts of the Tucson mountains, which as was explained last night are not sky islands, but they do go up to a little bit of grassland type habitat near the top of Wasson Peak, which is only 4,600 feet. And to the east and uh, south of us in the desert grasslands, there's the soap tree yucca. And this plant is, is just notable to me because it looks like something Dr. Seuss designed. It's just not a, a real credible looking plant. Jojoba is a, a very interesting bush. Um, it's dioecious, you've heard that word before uh, earlier tonight. It means that the male and female flowers are on separate plants. Flowers is kind of pushing it. They're not real spectacular or even noticeable. This is a wind pollinated plant, so it doesn't need to advertise uh, to insects or birds or anything else. It just, uh, the wind blows the pollen around. And these uh, seeds, these nuts that are about a half inch to three quarters of an inch long are valuable because they contain a liquid wax. Uh, most people refer to it as an oil that's pressed out of them. And this is used in a whole bunch of products like shampoos and uh, soaps, cosmetics, things of that sort. Anything that says jojoba um, has this in it. Now this plant is actually commercially grown in the Hyder Valley out near Yuma, out in the west coast area there of Arizona that we heard about earlier. It's got these green leathery, gray green leathery leaves and they point upwards and they're usually oriented so the sun is just hitting the edge of the leaf instead of full on the blade there. And that's an adaptation to not over overheating. Now there's a couple of plants that bear mentioning. The uh, creosote bush we've, we've heard earlier. Uh, it's actually found in three of the North American deserts. It does not occur in the um, Great Basin Desert because it's too cold. That's about the only thing stopping it. It occurs in the other three deserts. It's considered one of the most drought tolerant plants, if not the most drought tolerant plant in North America. So in some of the dry parts of the desert, uh, which we see going west from Tucson and over into California and into the lower um, Mojave Desert, some of those very dry areas are dominated by creosote bush. Now it doesn't normally look as nice as these. These are, are, are a couple of plants that uh, right after some good summer rains, they are good winter rains, spring rains, they've got the flowers, they've got green leaves, they look pretty good. Most of the time when you see creosote bush, it looks like this, sort of a gray green, brownish, scraggly plant. But as you can see, it's almost the only plant out there. 
except interspersed with it, you're going to see some other short grayish green um, little shrubs. And these are the burr sages. Here in the Tucson area, we have the triangle leaf burr sage, whereas uh, further west in the Colorado Desert of California, the lower Mojave Desert, and the areas between Tucson and Yuma, you've got the white burr sage. Now, again, these are after the rain, they look pretty good. Most of the time, if they have leaves at all, they're, they're kind of dull, gray, dusty looking. The plant's only about a foot tall. It has no showy flowers. It's got these irritating burrs that get stuck in your socks. It seems like these plants have almost no redeeming value, but they are, uh, of course, uh, very valuable plants. And uh, the reason being that both the creosote and the burr sage can grow anywhere. They can grow just out in the middle of the desert, out in the middle of a, a barren plain. They can grow and therefore they provide shade and perhaps food for desert animals and other plants. And that includes uh, some of our most iconic plants like the saguaro. A baby saguaro, a seedling saguaro, is a little tiny sack of water and it would desiccate really easily uh, and it, it would be a nice juicy treat for a rodent, but by growing underneath uh, a shrub, a small shrub, it gets shade, it uh, lower temperature, higher humidity, plus the protection of the branches helps these things get started. And so for that reason, these plants are usually referred to as nurse plants. So even the most unprepossessing looking plants can be extremely valuable members of the ecosystem. Well, in this uh, program, I've just real briefly touched on 25 species of plants. Uh, I did mention at the beginning that there are some 2000 species of plants in the Sonoran Desert. So by my calculation, that leaves you about 1,975 plants that you need to come out here and discover. And I hope you will do that. Thank you. And that's it. Thanks so much, Phil. That's really, really fun. Yes, you're right. You've only touched the surface on our Sonoran Desert flora, but we appreciate your, your guidance in negotiating that. So we have a couple of questions here for you. Um, one question is about the Santa Rita prickly pear cactus. Um, what, what causes the change in color in the Santa Rita prickly pear? Some seasons they say it's pinkish and in other seasons it's almost deep violet blue. Is it temperature or sun or something else? My understanding of it is uh, that it's temperature and, and stress, the colder, <laughs> colder season, if there is such a thing anymore, um, tends to stress the plants. And you'll notice that a lot of the prickly pears and choyas will get purplish in the winter. And so I think it's temperature and perhaps the dryness. Uh, winter rains aren't as copious as the summer normally. Um, and so you do see that they're a deeper purple more often in the, in the winter. Okay, thank you very much. And another question um, from one of our audience members, are any of the legume trees in Arizona toxic or are they all edible? The seed pods, as far as I know, are all edible. Now there are some plants that grow seed pods that look like they should be beans that are not, I'm not, I, I, I'm, I better be careful on that. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, the ones that I showed you are all, all have edible seeds. But it's my understanding that in the mesquite, it's the pod that's really the most edible part and the seeds are just so hard that. On the, on the mesquite? Yeah. Yeah, mesquite seeds, um, they're really hardly, they're tightly attached to the pod and generally when people grind them, they grind the whole thing. Or if you chew on them, you chew the whole thing. Um, I've always told people that there's a couple of ways of separating the seeds. And one of them is to run them through a javelina or a coyote first, but uh, they, a lot of people don't find that very appetizing. The other is that it seems that if you run over them in the museum parking lot, that separates them. But uh, again, I don't know whether I'd want to. 
harvest those. Both of those are options, I'm sure, but um, you probably don't want a lot of people bringing their pods to the museum parking lot to uh, no. be hostile in any way. So, um, okay, just a second. Uh, um, well, here's a comment from uh, one of the audience about uh, legumes you didn't talk about that that are toxic. Erythrina is one of them. I was. That's what. That's what held me up. I was. Uh, I thought that might be. Uh, yeah, yeah. Erythrina is. Is reputedly very toxic, and then sophora. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure. Is sophora, sophora is more eastern in distribution, right? Is it? Is it? Would you consider it native to this part of the world, or is, am I wrong? I'm not familiar with it. It's. Um, they call it Texas laurel. Oh, yeah. No, I don't think that's a. I don't think that's a Sonoran Desert plant. I mean, you, you, it's planted around here, but that's certainly. It's planted here. Yes. Yeah. Another comment about dermatophyllum, maybe in the Western. Um, oh, okay. Um, so one comment was that dermatophyllum in the Western Sonora might be a toxic legume. And um, I guess Wendy says that those are sophora that have been moved now into the, into the genus dermatophyllum. Well, I will. I'll stick to my uh, disclaimer that I'm not primarily a botanist. So. And I'm being corrected here, it says here that Sophora arizonica is a native in Arizona, and it's um, pigment and saccharin. That's that's outside of my range. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that, <laughs> but that was my error, not yours. So, okay. Well, um, we really appreciate your introduction to the Sonoran Desert, and that sort of closes the circle. We started along the southern border, we moved all over the state, and now we're back to the South. And so thank you so much for your presentation. We really appreciate your contribution. Um, well, thank you. It's been a pleasure.